the Lord had, has been putting something on my heart and I don't, uh, sometimes, you know, you wanna say something, but you don't know how to say it strong enough. Um, and then I remember, you know, uh, I love how the Bible puts things. Uh, the Bible's strong enough, wouldn't you say? Um, <clears throat> but sometimes I think you and I have a hard time. Um, <clears throat> we read the Bible, oh, that's the Bible. <clears throat> and those people were kind of, you know, crazy and uh, it's, it's so out of connection with thousands of years. But I think we have to remember it's not. Um, the Bible is timeless. It, it can, you know, the stories of the Old Testament 3,000 years ago, um, the more I read it, the more I realize those are for us. Those stories are for us today as much as they were back then. And the truth of the word is never changing. And, um, and so <clears throat> there's a topic that I have here that I think um, we all maybe, if, you're, if you've been around Christianity for a long time, it's, it's a topic we all know and it's a word we know. Um, but it's one that uh, it's been used and, and sort of accepted, but, um, but I wonder if, if we've lost the meaning over time of what it means to be actually practiced. Um, and it's, it, what's interesting is because we're saved by grace through faith, you can almost forget that uh, there's still stuff to do. Uh, as Christian men, there's still stuff to do. We've been saved by grace. Um, some people kind of check out at that point. Well, I'm saved by grace, gonna go to heaven, so the end. Now I'll just kind of keep doing my normal thing, including the list of sins and uh, the dark, evil stuff that we were supposed to let go of. Um, and so the word, the single word I wanna kind of talk about is the word sanctification. Sanctification, and we're, we're gonna dive into that. And there's so many places you could start in the Bible uh, with that, but I'm gonna start uh, because this is one of my favorite stories. It's Ezra chapter nine. Why don't you grab your Bible, turn to Ezra chapter nine, and uh, I wanna show you uh, some passages in the Bible that are linked to the idea of sanctification. There's doctrinal words um, that when you hear them, I hope you guys are uh, sort of perking your ears up to, okay, uh, I know what that means. I hope you know what justification means. I hope you know what sanctification means and propitiation and um, words like redemption. Like those are doctrinal words and um, they're, they're important to understanding our faith. Um, and so justification, uh, just as you're turning there to Ezra 9, justification is um, you know, what, what the Lord does by the work of the cross, though you and I are sinners, Jesus, though he who knew no sin, the Bible says he became sin, that is, took our sin upon himself, uh, all the sins of the world. And then because he died on the cross for our sins, our sins are blotted out. And the word justification, the best definition I, I have for that one I like is, um, the one that over the years that I've heard pastors use, just as if you'd never sinned at all. That's really what justification means. It's like, not only that you're forgiven, which you are, but it, it, your sins are forgotten. He remembers your sins no more. And so it's just as if you'd never done the evil deed that you did. That's justification. So that's why, you know, that's one of my favorite doctrinal words, justification. But sometimes people get justification and sanctification mixed up. And, um, and there is a big difference, and that's kind of one of the things we're gonna see here uh, this morning. So Ezra chapter nine, it starts out here in verse one, Ezra 9, one. Now, when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves uh, and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers hath been chief in this trespass. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair of my beard, uh, the hair of my head of my beard and sat down astonished. <laughs> uh, Ezra does something that you, you guys with beards know, it, you kind of go, ooh. He, he sat there and he ripped out his beard out of his face. Um, for a guy to do that, what, what, what do you have to do to get to that point where you're ripping your beard out? Um, 
uh, I, I don't know, you'd have to be pretty distraught if you ask me. I mean, it would take a lot to get me to that moment. I'm not even sure I have that kind of emotion. You could tell me, uh, you know, the worst news in the world. I'm pretty sure I wouldn't pull my beard out. Uh, I might do a lot of other things, but that wouldn't be on my list of things to do. But Ezra is this, this kind of a guy. Um, and, and some people might say, well, Brett, he's just kind of a passionate guy and a little bit weird. And the Jews were overly expressive in mourning and grief and stuff. Um, and you could make those arguments. The Jews were expressive uh, when they uh, were ripping their clothes and stuff like that when they heard bad news. But in this case, Ezra, Ezra um, you know, rips out his, his own beard of his face, uh, which, is, which is amazing. Now, um, what's funny about this is when you compare, you know, Ezra and Nehemiah are both contemporaries. And I always crack up because, uh, you know, Nehemiah, uh, similar time period, similar situation. In fact, keep your finger here and flip over just to the right in your Bible, maybe, uh, you know, 20 or 30 pages uh, to Nehemiah chapter 13. And you have a very similar situation. It's Nehemiah 13, 25. Um, so the same thing, you know, well, let's go to verse 23. Nehemiah 13, 23. It says, in those days I saw Jews that were, had married wives of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Again, they were intermarrying with these other Canaanite and, uh, you know, pagan cultures. Verse 24, and their children spake half in speech of Ashdod and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each of, uh, each of the people. So verse 25, I contended with them and cursed them and smote certain of them and plucked off their hair and made them swear by God saying, you shall not give your daughters to your, your sons to take their daughters or your sons for yourselves. So while Ezra was ripping out his own beard, Nehemiah was running around pulling everybody else's beards out. <laughs> Uh, and ripping their hair off and stuff like that. Uh, very different methods were uh, these two uh, leaders in Israel used. Uh, I found that there's often two kinds of guys. There's the Ezra's and the Nehemiah's. Some of you are beard rippers of your own face. Others of you are beard rippers of everybody else. And now, before you say, I, I, I kind of like to think of myself more as the Nehemiah, Pastor Brett. Before you say that, I wonder what God thought about Ezra's response, because um, that's kind of the only thing that matters, isn't it? Um, and as it turns out, both Ezra and Nehemiah served a purpose, and I, and I do think there are beard rippers both on both sides of that coin uh, in this life. I think there's people that are called to, um, to express and to show grief and to feel passionate about the current situation of our families, our lives, our people, our culture. And, and there's men that should feel it deeply in their own soul so much that by their own demonstration of passion and, and, and concern and care, um, it, it sets a fire in people's hearts. But I also know there's some guys the Lord's called to go around and do a little corrective kind of work that's a little more pointed and a little more uh, painful for everyone else. Now, with all that said, why, let's go back to Ezra. Why was Ezra so tweaked out? Um, this is something that people need to understand um, because you know, if, if you read this out of context, this whole thing here in Ezra 9, um, you'd think, well, the Lord's saying you're not supposed to intermarry between different races of people or, or, or different uh, people groups or something, but that's not what the Bible's teaching her. It was a specific mandate for the Jews to not marry within those other cultures that were around them. And it was largely due to God's A, plan for the Jews uh, prophetically, and B, uh, when, when you mixed it up with those people that were pagan nations, you're gonna start acting like pagans. And so the Lord called them all the way back in Deuteronomy and Moses and the, you know, giving of the law and all that. The Lord called the Jews to be separate and to not mix. In fact, mixture is the word that you come across often where, um, you remember when you're traveling through the wilderness and it says, in the mixed multitude, whenever you see that phrase, mixed multitude, um, it was always trouble. And the mixed multitude was, was the people that they would sort of tag along, uh, other people groups that jumped in with the Jews and said, oh, we'd like to be with you guys. And the Jews said, okay, you can hang with us, the mixed multitude. But it always caused trouble because the mixed multitude was constantly pulling the Jews out of whack, out of where they should be. And so God called the Jews to be separate from those other nations. And specifically, don't intermarry. Don't let your sons marry Moabite women because they're gonna, they're gonna make your sons worship the gods of Moab. And, um, uh, and by the way, um, the, you know, prophetically, <clears throat> the Jews also, Satan knew the Jews 
according to the, you know, Satan knows the Bible too, uh, that of the Jewish line would come the Savior, the Messiah. And I believe one of the, the uh, tactics of Satan was to mess up the line of the Jews. And you can see that all through the Bible. And, that, and it's even in our text here where it says um, in verse two, they've taken the daughters for themselves and for their sons so that the holy seed, um, what's that? Um, the, the seed there is the, the idea of the, the holy line um, ancestrally or you know, um, uh, through the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that holy seed that God set, us, set aside and was supposed to be set aside separate from all the other seed, if you would, um, that holy seed would be corrupted. Um, by the way, I think that's what was happening back in Genesis uh, chapter five, chapter six. You know, there's some strange things happened in the days of Noah. One of those things is the sons of um, uh, God had uh, sexual relations with the daughters of men. And you read that, you're like, what in the world is that all about? Um, and it, it brought out a group of giants, which is an interesting thing in and of itself. People get kind of weirded out by those scriptures. But I believe that was another attempt of Satan to mess up the seed and corrupt the line of humanity altogether. But this was more of a, a pragmatic practice of saying, oh, I'm not gonna have giants and weird demonic things going on Genesis five and six, but instead Satan would use a very normal thing and that is guys would lust after women that they should have been marrying and it would mess them up. That was Satan's tactics. Now, one of the things I wanna remind you guys about is um, you know, Satan wants to mess all of you and uh, us up badly. Don't forget Ephesians you know, chapter six, verses 10 and 11. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Uh, we don't use that word wiles any much, except for maybe wily e. coyote or whatever, I don't know. Um, but um, the word wiles, if you look up in a dictionary, it means a stratagem to, uh, or trick that's intended to deceive and ensnare. Uh, and that's what the Lord is telling us. Watch out, be strong in the Lord, brothers, he's saying to you and me and us. Uh, be strong in the power of his might, the Lord's might, and put on the armor of God that you may be able to withstand the strategies um, of the devil, the strategies that are meant to trick, deceive, or ensnare. The ESV calls it the schemes, as the devil is scheming, is scheming a secret or devious plan um, and, and, and as it turns out, one of, the, one of the major devices of the devil, and I think that, that maybe, maybe the Lord uses this against, uh, I should say this, maybe Satan himself uses this more against men than, than women. Um, you know, there's, there's different ways that men and women are, are deceived. I think we saw that in the Garden of Eden. You know, Eve was deceived by wanting to be enlightened. How many of you guys would have been there going, yeah, I want that, I want to be enlightened. Most guys don't care about that. But Adam was kind of tricked by the naked woman. There she was, hey, you big boy, and I'll take the apple, you know, whatever it was, whatever fruit it was. That, that's, we all have different things that we struggle with, but as it turns out, um, Satan wants to use um, something that will deceive you and ensnare you. And so we're not supposed to be ignorant of Satan's devices, the Bible says, but some of the wiles of the devil has to do with this idea of sanctification. He, he doesn't want you to be sanctified. What is sanctification? What is sanctified? Well, as it turns out, our text kind of tells us that. Um, did you notice here in our text, we have um, Ezra, you know, passionate about something. He's ripping his, his beard out. Why? Um, well, um, the idea is in verse one, it says, the, the Levites and the priests and the people of Israel have not separated themselves from among the people of the land. They've not, and, and this is the word you could sort of superimpose there. They have not sanctified themselves. They've not been separated out. Now we're getting to the definition. In fact, it even goes in verse two. It says, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. That's the second sort of reference. Separated, verse one, mingled. Um, they've been mingled together. And, um, and so this is the idea of, of, of you know, sanctification, to be set apart, to not be mixed up with the, the evils of this world and the things of this world. And so when Ezra realizes that the people, the, not only just the people, but the leaders, the leaders of the people, um, the Levites and the priests, like some of the guys that should have been you know, setting the standard and leading the charge, 
They're mingling themselves with Moabites, Hivites, Jebusites, flashlights, and all the others. Um, they're, they're, they're doing that and thus they're not being sanctified. That's kind of the word. Now in Christian theology, uh, a distinction is made between justification and sanctification. Justification refers to having saving faith. When you uh, believe and accept the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, that faith is that which saves and allows you to be just as if you'd never sinned. That's justification. But sanctification, it, it refers more practically to the process of gradual purification and cleansing from sin. Um, uh, a progressive spiritual growth in your own personal walk that should mark the life of a believer. Um, the doctrine of sanctification, when we, when we look at it in the Old Testament, it's, it's mostly just being set apart uh, and, and not mixed. But when you kind of dive into the sanctification concept in the New Testament, Testament um, it starts to move more to a, a process of us pulling ourselves further and further away from worldliness and, and godlessness. Um, and so, you know, this moving toward, now we'll get into that in a second, but um, here's the problem. Sometimes you and I as brothers, we're, we're not so concerned about practical holiness because of our positional Holiness. What's, what did I just say? <laughs> We're not so concerned about our practical holiness because of our positional holiness. What's, what are you talking about? Well, um, you know, remember when, when Paul said, you know, what shall we say there, Romans chapter six, verse one, you know, um, uh, shall we continue in sin and let grace abound? He's asking this question rhetorically. And he says, you know, the next verse, God forbid, God forbid that we, that we uh, you know, continue in sin and that grace is abound. So, when we talk about justification, that's God's grace. And it's a good thing. But do we just let grace abound and say, since we're saved by grace and I'm justified, my sins, you know, it's just as if I'd never sinned. Why shouldn't I just keep sinning? Man, party down. I'm saved by grace. Um, and so what can happen is we can use God's grace as a doormat to wipe our muddy feet off uh, as we trudge through the mud of sin. Uh, that's not what God wants. That's what Paul's saying here. What? Shall we just continue in sin, party down, and say, you know, well, let's just let grace abound. He says, God forbid. And, and so what's, what's this all about when I say that, you know, sometimes we're not so concerned about our practical holiness because of our positional holiness. Well, our positional holiness in Christ is where you're justified. But practical holiness deals with more with an idea of being sanctified or set apart, uh, and it's more of a progress. Um, I'm reminded of uh, the Bible. Um, you know those places the Bible says, be ye perfect? Does that make anybody nervous? Because uh, I'm not sure many of us in this room have uh, arrived. Anybody here arrived to perfection yet? Uh, there's always usually one clown that says, yeah, that's me. I, yeah, uh, no, none of us are even close, right? Not, not even close. So what do you do? Be ye perfect or be ye holy as I, the Lord, am holy. Uh, what do we do with that? Um, well, as it turns out, I've, I've gone over this uh, many times, but I'm gonna do it really quick here just to remind you of, of this is, I've, this for me has, has been super helpful to understand what the Bible has to say about you and I being perfect. There's three sort of perfections the Bible talks about that you should know about. The, the first one is positional perfection. That's this idea of justification, by the way. Um, you know, like uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, I'm just giving you one verse. There's actually a lot of verses with each of these points, these three that I'm gonna give you. But um, I'm just giving you my, my favorite verse that kind of goes with that. P positional perfection is like 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he hath made him, that's God, hath made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We are declared righteous because Jesus went to the cross and took on our sins. And so we're positionally in Christ called righteous, which is another way of saying holy or even perfect. Uh, righteous is sort of equated to the idea of perfection. <clears throat> so we have the first one is positional perfection, which is huge. Um, the second one, so, so this one links, by the way, more to justification. The second one deals more with sanctification, and that is progressive perfection. Here's an example, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 says, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? Um, verse, verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. 
what, what, what's the purpose of the church and to have pastors and teachers and evangelists and apostles, prophets? Um, why are those guys in those, those offices in the church, why do they exist? It's meant for the purpose of perfecting. Now the word perfecting is a work in progress. It's not that they will make you perfect instantly. We're instantly positionally perfect in Christ. If you accept Jesus, Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the whole world. All the sins you'll ever have committed, will commit. That's why you're positionally perfect. But you and I both know, as we walk this life, we're far from practically perfect, right? Um, we, we actually realize, oh man, the older I get, that's what Paul was talking about. When Paul, you know, sort of was grieving, oh, I, he said in Romans, I do the things I don't wanna do and I don't do the things I do wanna do. Um, and he goes on that whole rant about I don't do and I do and I do and I don't. And, I, and he just kind of goes on. And then in, when Paul was an old man, he says to Timothy, I, Paul, am the chiefest of sinners. He said that not long before he would be killed by Nero in Rome. Um, shouldn't have Paul been perfect by that time of his life? Well, even Paul the apostle who was called the Pharisee of Pharisees still knew that he was far from perfect. But he also knew that he was positionally perfect in Christ, but progressive perfection was, he was a work in progress. Um, and that's what the Lord does in us. So there's a third one, um, and that is uh, what I'm gonna call promised perfection. And that is, you know, scriptures like this, Ephesians 5, 27, that um, the Lord Jesus is gonna present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. There's coming a day in the future where the Lord's gonna present us his bride to, to Jesus the bridegroom as a spotless bride. Um, that's coming in the future. You know, we have other passages in, in like Revelation you know, 20, 22 it talks about how, you know, when we uh, get to heaven, he's gonna make old things pass away. All things are gonna become new. No more tears, no more sorrow, no more sin. It's all gonna be done away with. That's gonna be promised perfection. Uh, that's gonna happen like we, uh, the Bible says, when we see him, we will be like him. Uh, when we get to see the Lord as believers, that's a different, whole nother level of perfection. It's a promised perfection that we're gonna eventually uh, enjoy. So those are the three kinds of perfections. You got you know, positional perfection or perfect in Christ right now. If you're a Christian, God looks at you as uh, robed in righteousness and he says, you are perfect, uh, which is glorious. That's how you get to heaven, by the way. That's the one you get to heaven by. Do you get to heaven by progressive perfection? No, good news, man because you and I are gonna struggle with that to the day we die. And if you think, that's, that's where people get it wrong. They think, oh, if I can clean up my act and if I can do better and be better, then I might make it to heaven. No, we're saved by grace through faith justification, but you're not saved by um, you, know, uh, you figuring out how to get better and better. And so this is where the rub comes back to Ezra. Um, Ezra realizes that you know, they're God's chosen people, and they're supposed to be separate. And Ezra realizes they're not only not being separate, they're moving the wrong direction radically. And there's people that aren't even speaking the language of Hebrew anymore. Um, they're going to marry all these Moabites, Jebusites, Hivites, Perizzites, all these other nation people groups and Hebrews becoming extinct because they're mixing up their, their uh, marriages and what have you. And so Ezra freaks out because this idea um, that these guys, you know, uh, were mixing themselves up with the world. And this raises a question to you and me. Um, if we're saved by grace through faith, justification, should we just throw out the idea of sanctification? Um, that's the problem today. I think those of us that have enjoyed God's grace and being saved by God's grace, how important it is, and I'm not diminishing that at all, but we're still supposed to be up for changing we're supposed to be moving in the right direction. Rather than moving to worldliness and mixture with the world, we're called to be set apart. Um, that's what the Lord calls us to do. And, and how fervent are you toward that? Are you as fervent as Ezra? You know, when you see in your family at home and your, your son is you know, um, starting to watch things on video games that he shouldn't be watching, are you pulling your beard out? Uh, when your daughter uh, is you know, listening to music that is far, far away from God. Um, and I'm not trying to be a legalist here or anything like that, but there starts to be a thing where you're like, man, I think we're going the wrong direction as a family. 
Um, when you start to find yourself looking at stuff that you shouldn't look at, um, or watching movies and TV shows that you know are only gonna make you lust or um, get you in trouble with uh, the wrong heart and attitude and sinful behavior. Um, have we lost our passion and maybe even our fervor for God altogether? Oh, saved by grace, uh, you know, it's so awesome, I'm going to heaven, cool. And so we just, we just kind of forget this idea that we're called to be separate and to come out from among them and to be separate. That's what the Bible tells us we're supposed to do. And yet I, I'm, I'm worried that sometimes we don't, we don't even care about that. So, um, you know, we, we have to understand, you know, even as um, the Old Testament people, Ezra's people, did God notice that they were doing this, that they were not being sanctified, that they were mixing it up? The answer is absolutely, <clears throat> and it's gonna cost them. Even though they're God's chosen people, it's still gonna cost them. You know, <clears throat> one of the things I think we, um, we make a mistake on this idea of being sanctified is the long suffering of God or his patience um, should not be misinterpreted as ignorance that God doesn't know that you're being worldly, or even that God doesn't care that you're being a worldly man. Oh, but I'm saved by grace, but I'm going to heaven. Yeah, but does God care that you're looking at porn? Does God care? Well, I'm saved by grace, so I you know, wipe my feet on the grace mat of, you know, and but no, that's the wrong heart, and that's the wrong attitude. We should be pulling our beards out, um, like Ezra. The long suffering of God should not be misinterpreted as ignorance, but God is patient, don't, but don't mistake patience for weakness. Luke chapter 21, look, look at this, Luke, Luke 21, 34, it says, but watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, that that day and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap, for it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. But stay awake at all times, praying, that you may have the strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. You know, God's mercy shouldn't be misunderstood as approval. Um, the Bible warns us that we're supposed to be watching and waiting and not be weighed down. So, you know, like, you know, um, Hebrews talks about setting aside the weight that besets us, the sins that weighed us down. We gotta put that stuff aside. We're supposed to care about personal holiness and sanctification. Now here's where it gets tricky because some people let that start moving over to uh, how you're saved. If you think you're saved by being good enough, then we're, then we're off the rails already. So it's a little bit tricky. We're saved by grace through faith period, the end. But remember when James says, but faith without works is dead? This is the idea of sanctification. You know, if you're saved by grace, as, as men in Athey Creek here, if we're saved by God's grace, then guess what? One of the evidences of that salvation should be good works, moving in the right direction. In other words, maybe sanctification, that we're a work in progress, moving toward holiness. But we live in a world, you guys, and I think you're all really aware of that, where I think personal holiness is, is becoming harder and harder. I don't know. Um, you know maybe it's harder today. Um, I've often thought about this. Man, we in modern day Christianity, we're toast, man, because we got pornography and everybody's got a cell phone and you got the whole world in the palm of your hands. You can see whatever you want to see. You can do whatever you want to do. And I think we're at a huge disadvantage to the old days. But then I go to places like Jarish and Jordan and when I was walking through the streets there of this archaeological dig, um, one of the... One of the um, temples there, it, it, it was kind of shocking to see, but it was obvious what, what it was all about. It was this temple to the goddess Diana. Who was Diana? This multi-breasted goddess of the pagan worlds of the Canaanites. Um, the same goddesses that these guys in Nehemiah and Ezra's day were getting caught up into. Um, and what was happening in the temple of Diana, it was a very, cl the classiest, most impressive building in all of Jerish is, you know, the, the, the temple to Zeus and the temple to the goddess Diana. And you go by this really classy, beautiful building, but on the outside of the temple of, the, of, of Diana, there's all these, well, it looks like little miniature stages built into the side of the temple, low, high, middle, um, you know, 40 feet up, there's these little platforms and stages. And, um, and what were those there for? Naked ladies dancing, luring men to come into the temple of the goddess Diana to, to go in and have, you know, uh, sex with a temple prostitute. Um, maybe they did have it a little harder 
uh, or the same. I mean, could it be that we're all, humanity, we've always been tempted. We've always had access to all kinds of you know, sin and, and debauchery. But as men, I wonder if our culture, we've kind of just given up and said, well, it's all there and we're all, I guess we're saved by grace. So, oh, well, I guess we're just gonna have to struggle until heaven comes. I don't think that's what God wants. We should be pulling out our beards and we should be passionate about, Lord, am I being sanctified? Am I moving toward holiness um, as just a, a response to the grace that you've shown me and the salvation that you've given to me? Um, you know, uh, it's Ephesians chapter five that kind of talks about this as well. And this is sobering. These are sobering words. Ephesians, I've got the ESV version on this one because uh, I, I like to change it up a little bit just to have us think about it maybe in a uh, more modern language. Um, Ephesians five, verses five through 12. It says, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. And it goes on in verse seven, therefore do not become partners with them. What's that? These people that are you know, set on sin and, and these sins that were just listed, don't be partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. In other words, you're safe. So it says, walk as children of the light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Would you note that verse 10? What, what should you and I be doing? We should be going around discerning, Lord, is this pleasing to you? Is the thing that I'm doing right this very minute bringing pleasure to you? Because guess what? You and I were created for his pleasure. Uh, Revelation 4.11, the Lord is, uh, tells us that. You were created for his pleasure. So we, one of the greatest questions you can ask yourself as a man is, what I'm doing right now, is this pleasing to the Lord? Verse 10, verse 11, take no part in the unfruitful, fruit work, uh, unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. Um, one of the things I think some guys have done, some guys have said, well, I'm gonna try to be pleasing to the Lord and not engage in unfruitful works of darkness. But the, the secular world has done a good job silencing Christian men. Well, we don't wanna say anything that ruffles feathers. And if we call it out for sin like it is, we might make people mad at us and we don't wanna lose our job or we don't wanna get in trouble in the neighborhood. Or, so so we, we men have been silenced when it comes to the idea of holiness and, and purity. Um, and because we're silent, I, I worry that we're uh, snowballing. You know, if, if we as dads and grandfathers are silent about unholy things, then our sons just kind of roll right into it. Um, our neighbors and our families and the people we work with, we're, we're just rolling right into the unfruitful works of darkness. But instead, we're, it says here in the Bible, expose it for what it is. For it, uh, verse 12, it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. Um, now, by the way, in Ephesians 5, 5 through 12, some people say, well, who can go to heaven if it says everyone who's sexually immoral or impure or is covetous, uh, has no inheritance of the kingdom of God? This is the same thing where several of those lists in the Bible that says those who continually practice such things will not inherit. The idea is if you're um, not really repentant, and you're purposefully trying to engage in these things. You will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. But Brent, I thought I was saved by grace through faith. Um, this is where there's a line, and I don't know where it is. God knows where it is. But there's a line where I, I have to say, is a person really even saved? Did they ever really repent of their sins and accept really from their heart, through their mouth, and belief in Jesus, it gets really complicated. People are like, well, I, I believe in Jesus, I accept Jesus when I was in fifth grade, and, but I'm still looking at porn and, I, and I'm still committing adultery, but I'm saved by grace through faith. I can't promise that guy that he's even saved. He might think he's saved, but I can't sit there and you know, pat him on the back, well, you got saved in fifth grade, so it uh, must be good. Now, is it possible that he's saved? It could be, but you know, these verses, you know, that's where the Calvinist argument and the Arminian argument gets really goofy to me. 
And, and it's one of the reasons, if you've been around AC Creek for very long, you know, some of you, if you're here, sometimes you're like, oh, Brett's a Calvinist. And then there's other times, oh, Brett's an Arminianist. Uh, maybe he's a Calvinianist. Uh, like, what is Brett on that? Well, I think it's a false dilemma. The Bible teaches, I, I, can, I can show you scriptures about eternal security, and I believe I'm eternally secure by the grace of God. I believe in his, uh, security 100%. Um, well, Brett, then, but so, so you can't lose your salvation. Well, I don't know. I mean, you, I, I could show you other scriptures um, that make me a little nervous if a guy's boasting, I'm saved by grace through faith, but he's showing evidence of just total sin and debauchery. I can't, I can't sit there and say, I'm gonna t- talk to you about eternal security. Um, you know what I love about the Bible is I've got ammo in the Bible for just about anything you throw at me. Like, for example, the, the, the guy that comes in and says, Pastor Brett, I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to hell. Why? Well, you know, I've accepted Jesus and I love Jesus with all my heart. And I'm, I, but but I, I was driving down the road and I, I saw a woman that was really pretty and I lusted after her. I'm pretty sure I'm going to hell now. Oh, let me show you some scriptures. Uh, we're saved by grace through faith. And, and even Paul, and, 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 you know, sinned and struggled with sin. And we all struggle with sin. And as long as, you know, you're struggling with that, that's a good sign. As long as you feel like that guy, I can start saying, hey, John chapter 10, no man can pluck you out of the hand of the Father. I can talk to him about some eternal security scriptures like to no end. And I love that. Different guy comes into my office uh, Pastor, Brady, yeah, I'm, I'm saved by grace through faith, and I uh, got saved, uh, accepted Jesus at Athey Creek, looked up, and uh, but you know, uh, my wife, she's getting a little old, and I've just found that there's, it's it's kind of nice sleeping around. I I, I just kind of do that, and I I figured out ways to sort of make that convenient and uh, easy for me. And believe it or not, I've had guys come to my office and say this. Um, I'm pretty sure you're going to hell, buddy. <laughs> but what about eternal security? Well, I can show him scriptures like this, you know, for you may be sure of this. It says, everyone who is sexually immoral and impure, who is covetous, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God. I can show you scriptures that, that should make you really nervous. So, so when, when the groups are trying to, you know, defend one side or the other, why does the Bible seem to give us both sides of that argument? Because there's different people and there's different attitudes. But... You know what I love about the Calvinist, and it's not just that argument, it's like, you know, once saved, always saved, or eternal security, or predestination, divine election, whatever controversial topic you're getting into. One of the things I love about this, and and I think if you get an honest Calvinist and an honest Arminianist together, and we have an honest conversation, I think we all agree, what if we just got rid of the, trying to find the, the last possible line where you're still saved, and what if we all just agreed, let's just go radical for the Lord? Let's serve Jesus. Instead of you know, pushing the limits with adultery and hoping you're still saved, what if you just say, man, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Jesus said, they will be filled. Not trying to find the line where you're still safe. No, find the line, how far radical, holy, and sanctified can you be? Then the argument goes away if you're doing your best to serve the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Um, and this is where I, I, I'm concerned for us in modern days, in 2023. I, I worry that we've lost the edge of concern or passion like Ezra to even care anymore, let alone rip out your beard. I'm not even sure we get upset anymore. Um, does the moral condition of our nation bother you at all? Um, I hope you're at least bothered. We should be at least bothered. Um, does it bother us that there's drag shows with these men dancing and doing lewd acts in front of our children all over the country? Should that bother us? Um, you know, do we have groups that um, you know, are going around saying, hey, we want to disrupt the nuclear family? Um, one of the greatest satanic things in our nation, if you ask me, is making families fail. Divorce, single parents trying to raise kids, that's the hardest thing in the world. And if I was Satan, I'd be like, yeah, let's destroy the nuclear family. So Black Lives Matter comes out and everybody's like, rah, rah, Black Lives Matter, George, George Floyd, the whole thing. And everybody gets all, but they, they don't even, Christians all over Black, Blackout Tuesday, but they don't even care that this organization on their website was saying, we want to disrupt the nuclear family. Um, meaning, it's not about having a mom and a dad. 
Um, and, 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 you know, the, the racial issue is a whole, to me, it's a whole separate issue. But that group snuck their weird worldviews in. Now, I have to say, I'm glad that Black Lives Matter as an organization has been kind of exposed. And the, most, most people are all like, yeah, the buying of the mansions with all the money that was donated and stuff. Yeah, kind of showed them for what they really are. That's the way Marxism works, by the way, which is all about what they were into. To me, it's such a tragic thing because the real issue of racism is, is it's been like worsened um, because of the weirdness of this organization, let alone the trying to disrupt the nuclear family. Like to me, it's so sad how Satan just wins on all points on that one. Um, does it, should it make us mad that there's somebody going around, there's groups going around saying, we want to disrupt your family and no more man, woman, you know, we don't even believe in fathers. In fact, we don't even believe in, in women anymore. Um, should it make us mad, mad that there are men going around saying they're women and they can give birth and all this stuff? Um, should, it, should, should we be pulling our, beer, our beards that women, uh, children are being sexualized at an early age and this, this curriculum that's being adopted in our local schools? Um, should, should it? Should, where, where is, now I have to say, uh, if, you're, if you're watching what's going on, there are finally some, some men standing up in school districts and going to school boards. Now I'll warn you, if you go to a school board and talk about the sex curriculum, they're gonna deem you as a domestic terrorist in our culture today, even though you're actually a godly father who cares about kids and children. Um, you know, um, should, should we be pulling out our beards that pedophilia is being normalized as we speak? Should that bother us in our culture? Or are we as men, <laughs> I think I'll go to work today and, uh, go to church on Sunday and just kind of, yeah, at least I'm saved going to heaven. <laughs> Good for me. Or, or, or should we be perhaps a little more concerned or passionate, maybe even pulling out the beard? Um, we have, <clears throat> by the way, all those topics, we have so-called Christian churches <clears throat> and pastors and, and ministries accepting all of those things I just mentioned. Uh, we, have, we have churches now in New York City that have drag queens for their pastor. Um, I showed a video of that at one of our, I think it was our prophecy, one of our prophecy updates, and it's, it's horrifying. The Episcopal Church is always leading the charge on those kinds of crazy things. Um, you know, we have pornography ruining people's lives and marriages and um, ruining men. <clears throat> I, think, I think pornography is the secret killer of manliness. Um, the more a guy engages in that unholy practice, um, you know, the, the, that guy, he, he ruins himself. The Bible talks about how, you know, there in Proverbs talks about when a man commits adultery, it's like his soul is being diminished, your mind, your emotions. And yet men are just, you know, hook, line, and sinker going for pornography, and we don't even realize how it's destroying marriages and families. You know, when I was a kid, I'd never heard what ED was. And now every other commercial on TV, or if, they're, if you watch commercial TV anymore, thank the Lord, that's not even the thing as much anymore. Um, but uh, like, what happened? Why, why are suddenly, you know, people wonder why are testosterone levels diminishing? I have some theories. And a lot of it has to do with just sin and debauchery and the way our culture has gone. And I wonder where are the men who are pulling out their own beards? I, you might say, uh, where are the men pulling out other men's beards? I'm, I'm wondering about that. Um, there's times where I've wanted to pull out everybody else's beard, but um, notice um, if you have that sort of mindset, don't, you know, if you wanna be perfect, you gotta remember what Jesus said. Matthew chapter seven, uh, verses three through five. It says, and why beholdest thou the mote that is in your brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in your own eye? See, before you start pulling other guys' beards out, you better make sure you've got your thing dialed in. That's the problem. If I wanna be a Nehemiah, you better be a really solid dude who's got it dialed in. And I'm not there yet, so I've gotta be careful. I'm not gonna pull other guys' beards out. I need to pull my own beard out first uh, before I you know, pull the beam. Uh, he goes on, Jesus goes on in verse four, or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in your own eye, you hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of your own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote that is in your brother's eye. One of the most dastardly things about, say, like the issue of pornography, is when a guy engages with pornography, suddenly he's, he considers himself ill-qualified 
to holiness. And I have to say, in some ways, he's right. Like if a guy's uh, messing around with pornography, pretty soon he has no you know, argument, no teeth in his argument um, if he's arguing for holiness, but he himself is personally wrapped up in sin, it, 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 it sort of disables his ability to pull the, the moat out of someone else's eye. Um, I almost wondered, and I, God forbid that I mess up the scriptures, I don't ever wanna do that, but I kind of feel like we're living a day where we're not just a, a, a bunch of guys where the guy with a beam and a moat. I think we're guys with a beam and a beam and a beam. We should, we should be wanting to pull the beams out of everybody's, we're just beaming around the church with beams in our eyes, boom, boom, boom. I wonder if people laughed when Jesus said this. I think this is humorous when you think about it. You know, you're walking around, there's a guy with a little speck in his eye, but you're walking around with a beam in your eye. Like that's hilarious when you think about it, walking around, dong, dong, dong. Like that's, that's funny imagery. Until you realize what he's talking about, then you think, man. The guys with the beams in their eyes were not so good at helping people. And when it comes to the issue of holiness and sanctification, if we're walking around with beams in our eyes, it, Satan's got you right where you, he wants you. He's got you in a place of disabled uh, spiritually. You're disabled from being a, a light in this dark world. You're suddenly ill-qualified. And, and I, I'm concerned that we've forgotten as men that we are called by God to be separate. Men of integrity, men of honesty, men of purity. And um, while none of us are gonna arrive until we uh, are perfect uh, progr- uh, in our future perfection, you know, uh, promise perfection, we, we still need to let the Lord do a work in our lives and start fixing and changing and, and not to forsake this idea of sanctification. We're called to be separate from this world. And I'm concerned that even churches, by our trying to look and be more like the world, um, we've done a really good job. And the churches are looking more and more like the world in ways we would never wish for. Um, what did Paul say in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 15 through 18? It says, And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And it goes on in verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Interesting, you know, with kids and fathers and stuff, it's um, what a complex relationship when you're a dad and you have kids. But um, one of the saddest things, you know, you see that happens a lot is when a, a, a rebellious child gets so far rebellious that it makes it impossible for the dad and the mom to have a, a legitimate relationship with that child. Um, and it's, it's heartbreaking. I've seen that too many times as an old youth pastor and as a, as a senior pastor. Um, but it's, it's one of these images that stick in my head. When, when a child rebels enough and is just taking on sinful things, um, they don't even realize they, that they have, by their action, destroyed their relationship with their father or their mother. And I've seen parents who have tried to figure out that tricky balance. When do you, like, when your child has rebelled so hard, when do you say, I'm gonna deliver you and turn you over to your own sin? Because that's what God actually does. Remember Romans chapter one? I'm gonna you know, give you over to your flesh, your lustly desires, now the Lord says. But, but before that, the Lord is lovingly trying to woo us to himself. And that's what moms and dads do with their kids. Oh, come on, now you don't wanna do this. You don't wanna go that direction because it's gonna hurt you. You're the one who's gonna get messed up. Oh yeah, whatever dad, whatever mom. And there's a point where the kid goes so far away that sometimes the most loving thing you can do is to say, man, I'm gonna keep praying, I'm gonna keep loving, but I'm also gonna have to let them go in their own way. Could it be this is what the Lord, the Father in heaven is saying here when he says, come out from among them, be ye separate, and don't touch the unclean thing, and I will receive you and be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. But I wonder if some of you as men, if, if, if you're feeling distant from God 
and that God doesn't really, you don't have that relationship. It's almost like the high school kid or the college kid that's wondering, why don't my parents love me? Um, why, why are my parents acting this way toward me? And they don't realize they did it to themselves. The choices they made and the directions they took uh, made it really hard for them to have that relationship with their father and their mother. But the father in heaven says, I wanna be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, but you gotta be separate. You gotta come out from among them, the world, the worldliness. Uh, in the same way in the Old Testament, the Jews needed to come out from those pagan nations. The Lord says in his New Testament, the same thing does. Sanctification, be ye separate saith the Lord and touch not the unclean thing. So sanctification, to sanctify, means to be set apart for holy use. And that's what God's desire is for you. He wants to set you apart, make you different. Not like every other guy at work that's cussing and you know, partying down and you know, alcoholic and you know, uh, angry and uh, you know, lacking integrity. And, and, and what happens, we Christians, as we work around these guys, we gotta remember, come out from among them. It doesn't mean you can't be nice to those guys or share the Lord with those guys. You know, and, and remember, Jesus hung, would hang out, hang out with uh, publicans and sinners. But remember, those, those people always changed. The prostitutes, the publicans, the sinners, they stopped doing that when they hung out with Jesus. But I'm telling you guys, we're living in a day where I think we have to be more cognizant of the fact that it's time to come out. Um, maybe, maybe there's people you're witnessing to or sharing the Lord with and the Lord's got you in the worldly situations you are, and that's fine, that's good, but be the hammer, not the nail. Don't be influenced by those worlds, uh, the worldly things and those godless views. And just because everybody else is doing it doesn't make it okay. Come out from among them, be separate from them and still be salt, still be light. But as soon as you feel like you're being influenced, it's time to cut it off. Come out from among them, saith the Lord. This is the idea of sanctification. Um, it's, it's God setting us apart for the purpose of, of purity um, and not sinfulness. Um, and this is a theme throughout the Bible. I can just go on and on with scriptures. You know, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses three through eight. For this uh, is the will of God in your, what? Sanctification, to be set apart, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand, and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. This last phrase um, causes concern. If you're disregarding God's call to holiness, um, interesting, you're not disregarding man. See, this, there's, a, there's a temptation to think, well, you know, Brett's just being legalistic and telling us we're supposed to be set apart and holy. Nope, this is God who's saying this in his word to us, me included. He's talking to me as well. And all of us as men, we have to realize if you're disregarding this call to separation, sanctification and holiness, if you and I disregard that, you're not disregarding some sermon Brett's teaching. <laughs> you and I, we're, dis we're disregarding God himself who gives his Holy Spirit. Why does he give his Holy Spirit? To convict us. Uh, that's one of the things the Holy Spirit does is to convict us of sin. So being called to sanctification, we're called to do good works, to serve the Lord, to, to come out from the world and be different than the world. Um, you know, it, it's a tricky, tricky thing because there's monks who said, I, I'm gonna come out from the world. I'm gonna live in a, a cell in a monastery and be separate. I'm not sure that's what God had in mind. Um, uh, there's others, you know, some of the, the aesthetics of the old days, you know, like Simon the Stylite who said, I'm gonna be set apart. So he, they built a tower and had him sit up on the top of a tower on a little platform, just a like six foot by six foot platform. And he was like 40 feet up and they'd just throw him up food once in a while. And he was up there for something like, what was it, 40 years? He was up there trying to be separate from the world. I'm not sure that's what God had in mind. But... But I think what God had in mind is for us to live this life, do our work, be men of honor, integrity, and then, and then do whatever we can to fight against that temptation to be worldly and godless. We gotta be in this world, yes, but we don't have to be of this world. 
And that's what the Lord is calling us to do. Um, and, and, and I have to say, this, this is something I'm not hearing a lot of churches and men and pastors and people talking about. Um, and sometimes if, if, if we do talk about it, it comes off very legalistic. There's, there's some preachers that are trying to say the same thing, but it, it can come off if we're not careful. We have to be really careful not to, you know, um, let things bleed. Like for example, you know, be holy or else you're going to hell. Well, that's just not true. Uh, positional holiness, yeah, you gotta be holy. But practically none of us are gonna arrive but that's what happens. If we're not careful, we become kind of legalistic and self-righteous if we're not careful. But then if we don't attempt to be holy and talk about sanctification, then we it's sloppy agape. We're all about, oh, love, and God loves us, and we're saved by grace. And then we're out doing adulterous things and sinful stuff, and nobody's even convicted anymore. So we have to be really careful with this one. You don't wanna become legalistic and weird, but you also don't wanna become flippant when it comes to sanctification. God has called you and I as men. It's, it's all pretty simple if you really think about it, uh, to know what we're supposed to be doing and what we should not be doing. Uh, it's, but it's easier said than done. I, I will admit you on that one. Wouldn't it be great um, if, if you and I had some uh, brothers in our lives, and this is what we were trying to do a couple years ago and when we were uh, setting up accountability ideas, you know, like, like how do you get brothers who can come and stand with you and, and love, lovingly even, you know, give a word of strength or inc- even correction or admonition or exhortation to, to, you know, do the right thing and to walk the, the, the line and, and men that know who you are and what you're doing. Um, like that's such a valuable thing in these days. Your wife shouldn't be the one, guys that are married, uh, that's holding you accountable to being a man of integrity and honor. Like that shouldn't be your wife's job. There should be other brothers that stand with you um, and help you uh, and provoke you, like Hebrews says, provoke you to love and good works. Um, That's what the church is supposed to be doing. Um, So, you know, uh, all this to say, you know, Ephesians chapter two, verse 10, uh, it says, for we, are his workmanship. And this is right after Ephesians 2, 8, of course, you're saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, you know, like this is great. Right after that, it says in verse 10, it says, we are his workmanship uh, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Um, I'd like to finish with one more scripture. Would you flip over to Revelation chapter two? And in Revelation chapter two, you know, you remember the seven churches uh, of Asia Minor that Jesus talks to the churches and what a powerful thing, uh, the, the messages to the churches. We could do studies and probably should on all these churches because we learn so much. The churches had got, you know, off course, but the, the um, second of the churches, the church called Pergamos. The name itself is interesting, Pergamos or um, it, um, if you break it down in the language, you know, per um, means um, uh, against, like perverted, or it's a negative, per. And then gamas or gami, does anybody know what that means? Monogamy, or um, it actually, you might say marriage. Uh, so per gamas or per gami, uh, it means objectionable or against marriage. Huh, what? Objectionable marriage? Yeah, well, this, look, look at what Jesus says to Pergamos, verse 12. To the angel of the church at Pergamos, write these things, saith he which has the sharp sword with two edges. What's the sharp sword with two edges? The word of God, the word of God and it's coming from Jesus himself. He says, verse 13, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, Portland. <laughs> oh, wait, I added that, sorry. <laughs> and thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelt. Like this is where Jesus is commending them. And you had Antipas in your church. Um, and I, like he's commending them for that. But verse 14, I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine or teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Wow, here's Jesus saying he hates something. And it's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and seemingly similarly the doctrine of Balaam. 
Verse 16, repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Let him that hath ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. Um, interesting, you know, what, what's this all about? Um, well, first of all, he says the doctrine of Balaam and then the doctrine of Nicolaitans. So let's, let's just kind of readers digest this first because we're running out of time. But what was the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? Well, it had to do with this idea of mixture, mixing it up with the world and allowing worldliness and godlessness in. The story of Balaam is probably the most important. If you remember, Balak, king of Moab, called this weird little prophet named Balaam. I mean, Balaam wasn't even a Jew, by the way, um, but he was called a prophet in the Old Testament. And it's what a strange little guy Balaam was. And remember, Balaam rides his little donkey and he's gonna go curse the children of Israel for Balak. Um, and the do donkey starts talking like it's Mr. Ed moment in the Bible. It's like a, it's kind of a crazy story. But be that as it may, Balaam opens his mouth looking over Israel's camp on a cliff with Balak and he, and he can't speak curses. He, he can only speak blessing. And Balak's like, what, I paid you to curse these people. What are you doing? And Balaam, oh, I can only speak, that's all I can do. And so they get a different position and try it again. And again, instead of cursing, Balaam blesses the people of Israel. And, and the more he tries, the more he blesses them. And Balak's like, oh brother, you know, I, I didn't pay you to bless the people. You're supposed to curse them. But then Balaam, uh, you know, it's kind of a funny story. You, even if you paid me all the silver and gold, I couldn't curse these people, but... Uh, and then Balaam says, here's what you do. If you wanna curse the Jews, they can curse themselves. And, um, and Balaam's suddenly all ears. Well, what do I do? Balaam advised the Moabites on how to entice the people of Israel, particularly the men of Israel, with Moabite women. Get your prettiest Moabite girls and get them all gussied up, you know, put on the makeup and the, you know, sexual, sexual clothing that's luring the poor guy. And then those guys will come down and they'll go, ah, ah, those Moabite women are awesome. And, the, and, and, and then they'll, they'll be cursed because the Moabite women will bring their idols in their pockets and then the young men will start worshiping idols. Get them with the sexual perversion thing. It's the oldest trick in the book. Like, it's like, you know, if you're a football team and you have one play that gets you 10 yards every time, you run the play over and over again. That's what Satan does. So get the sexy girls dressed up and send them down to the boys. Oldest play in the book. Well, sure enough, Bala gets all his young Moabite girls. They go down and gussied up. And sure enough, the Jewish boys fall for it hook, line, and sinker. And before long, the Jews are now married to these Moabite girls and they're worshiping the idols of the Moabites. And do you remember, if, if you recall, when that happened, God then had to punish the children of Israel. And 24,000 people died in one day. Um, because of that mixture, mixing it up. That's the doctrine of Balaam, to teach a stumbling block and mixing it up. And it's funny that it, it always includes some kind of sexual thing, because that's the oldest trick in the book. But then, but then um, uh, there's kind of an interesting part of that story, if you remember. Remember the guy Phineas? Um, God basically says, if, if you married a Moabite, if you're one of those guys, uh, he told the Jews, kill those guys. That's why 24,000 people died. But there's a very specific, there was one couple, a, a Jewish boy and a, a Moabite girl, and they're you know, kind of you know, uh, you know, engaging sexually right in front of the people of Israel. That's how bad it had become. It's kind of like our culture, where you know, there's sex right in front of us all the time, fornication. So what did Phineas do? Phineas ran and he got a spear and he ran and he, and he this is a, like rated, rated PG, I guess. Um, he took the spear and he stuck it through the guy and the girl at the same time. One spear, I think they got the point. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but it was at that moment what moment? When Phineas stuck the man and the woman through with one fatal spear shot, then the anger of the Lord was, was appeased and, and the, the curse stopped at that moment. And you say, Brett, that's a horrible story. But you know what? It's a beard pulling moment, wouldn't you agree? I mean, the radical nature of the sin of the people of Israel was so bad that something drastic needed to happen to save the people of Israel and Phineas was the guy who was willing to do it. Um, he took the spear and stuck him through. Brett, are you calling us to arms? Um, nope. 
I'm calling us to be radical when it comes to this idea of being pure and holy and being set aside for God's purpose. For us to embrace the idea of sanctification once again and take it seriously. Because if you don't take it seriously, you are ignoring God, our scriptures told us today. You're ignoring him. We need those brothers take a whole nother look at our own behavior, you know, the beam in our own eye and say, Lord, how am I not allowing that sanctifying work in my life? What are the things I've just embraced as worldly godless things that shouldn't be in my life at all? And take a really hard look at it. And, and when I say pull out your beard and take out a spear, um, it might be something that looks more like, for some of you guys, it might be ditching the iPhone. And instead of getting a smartphone, get a dumb phone. Um, there's new dumb phones out there. Have you guys seen these new dumb phones? They kind of look like a little miniature iPhone, but all they do is text and uh, call. Um, you know, that's a, that's a spear moment. If, if your iPhone is stumbling you and you're looking at stuff that you shouldn't be looking at and you're doing stuff and, and you're nervous about, you know, who's picking up your iPhone and if your wife looks at your iPhone, if you're in that place, take a spear to it. Pull out your beard. Do something radical and say, forget it. Well, Brett, uh, I have to communicate with people. Well, text and, um, and uh, phone calls. Go old school. And well, Brett, what if I can't do effective? You're not as effective at work, but at least you're not gonna die spiritually. At least you're not gonna be separate from the Lord. What is it that you're, the Lord's hand is not short that he cannot touch you. His ear is not deaf that he cannot hear you, but it's your sin that separates you from God. That's why we're called to be separated from sin so that we're close and linked to walking with the Lord. So, you know, um, Jesus tells these guys in Revelation chapter two, um, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans and the teaching of doctrines of the Nicolaitans and of Balaam. And Satan's tactics haven't changed that much. Um, if he can't curse you directly, he will allow you to curse yourself by your own sins and taking up sin. And we'll wonder, why do I feel distant from God? Why are my kids rebelling? Why is my wife not like me? Why am I failing at work? I think a lot of times it has to do with us saying, are we willing to do what we need to do to be set apart for God's purpose? Um, I know this is kind of a heavy thing, but can I just ask you guys to pray about this? Like, don't just hear this thing, oh, Brett gave kind of a heavy word today, whatever. Um, no, do business with the Lord, just you and the Lord right here and right now and say, Lord, what is it that I need to do that's pull it, beard pulling, beard pulling, spear sticking moment to, the, to deal with the sin that's, that's holding me back? I, I think, um, you know, the church is in peril right now, the greater church, because men are not leading. There's a lot of women leading in churches and this whole egalitarian movement where women are leading the church. And I feel like there's only a few of us that are saying, yeah, the Bible doesn't teach that anymore. You know, like the Bible doesn't teach that women should lead the church. But one of the reasons men are not leading the church is I think we have disqualified ourselves because we're not sanctified. We're too busy sinning with pornography and with you know, ugly man behavior. And so the church has become so weak. And that's what I'm so thankful. I truly am thankful for the group of men at Athe Greek. I, I know that there's a lot of solid brothers here in this church who are saying, we're doing our best to be set apart, be sanctified. But how can we do better with that? That's the question. How can we as men at Athe Creek be strong leaders in our families, our homes, places we work? The first thing we have to make sure is that we're sanctified that we're a work in progress, never arriving, but how are we doing right this moment with things like pornography, with things like honesty and integrity, with um, the sins that Satan continues to lure us and, and try, you know, are we doing good with that? Um, it's time to, to take it up. These are days, I think, where it's time to be serious about being a man of, of integrity, a man of holiness, set apart, sanctified. So Lord, I pray as we uh, think about this today, that you'd just uh, help us to think honestly and rightly about ourselves. Um, Lord, if there's things we need to do drastic um, to fix problems, Lord, I pray that you'd uh, awake all of us out of our lull, Lord, as we um, start to get accustomed to sinfulness and, uh, and things that we once called sin that maybe we're not even calling sin anymore because we've um, adjusted Lord, I pray that you'd resensitize us. Um, Lord, you tell us your Sermon on the Mount, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I pray that all my brothers in this room, those listening online right now, that we'd be filled because of that promise that we're hungering 
and thirsting after righteous. Lord, show us how to be radical in this. Um, forgive us for being sort of tepid in our response, but I pray that you'd find a radical bunch of guys even doing some beard pulling if necessary, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.